Good morning, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all today on behalf of the ABN Core Committee for our 106th webinar. I would like to thank all of you for your interest and your continued active participation and commitment towards this webinar series. I would like to thank the Core Committee of AABN for collaborating and organizing this weekly webinar in these very challenging times. We are well represented from several domains here today. As we move forward to ensure the future of AABN, we'll continue to invest the vast potential inherent in collaboration among individuals of varying backgrounds, perspectives, and expertise. I would like to thank Dr. Parthapi Maitra, President Strategy and Initiative, Reliance Industries Limited, our guest speaker today for willingly cooperating to share his valuable knowledge and experience on sustainability the way ahead. Only through collective efforts can we improve the environment and ensure a greener and more sustainable future for all. Sustainable, sustainability is no longer a tick box or checklist ex exercise. It's a critical investment area where organizations can realize genuine returns and opportunities for competitive advantage. In order to make the right decisions, access to accurate and reliable data is critical. After all, organizations can't track trends, changes, or improvements to their operations and initiatives if they don't have access to the right data. Industries are facing pressure to transform their op operation and achieve goals to reduce their carbon footprints and greenhouse gas emissions, both in the near term and in the long run. These industries are looking for a holistic, creative approach to meeting these goals, which will likely require industries that have historically been independent of each other working together. The AAB and Core Committee team welcomes you to join them in this webinar on sustainability the way ahead. Focus on the topic of sustainability. Attendees will learn about practices they can employ to create meaningful, measurable changes that benefit not only the environment, but also the bottom line. In this webinar today, Dr. Parthapi Maitra will outline the trends leading the way to net zero, energy transition, clean energy, etc. In a fast moving economy where energy prices and energy demand are rising, Oil and gas companies have set multiple targets to diversify the portfolio in an aim to reach net zero targets. This webinar will look at how companies are addressing energy transition by shipping into new technologies which can help decarbonize their operations and which are the main strategies taken for positioning ahead its peers. He will explore the carbon management journey of industry. He will review the primary drivers encouraging industries to set carbon management and greenhouse gas emission goals such as environmental social governance factor, regulations, and worldwide initiatives. He will discuss how to establish baseline data that can help set the stage for the prioritization of carbon management goals. I have the pleasant duty of welcoming and introducing Dr. Partha P. Maitra today at Sustainability the Way Ahead, an interactive business networking session. Dr. Partha Maitra heads strategic planning and long-term initiatives at Reliance Industries. Strategic planning covers business development for new growth projects including the oil to chemical or OTC transformation of, of Jamnagar. Long-term initiatives include conceptualizing energy transition and decarbonization for land net zero by 2035. Started professional career at Floor Houston, working on energy conservation projects at ExxonMobil, Baton Rogue, and Baton Refineries. Modernization projects at BP's US Refineries and the Flexi Coking project at Shell's Martinez Refinery. Prior to Reliance, he developed the detailed feasibility report to launch the Mangalore Refinery and Petrochemicals Project. Conceptualized the Jamnagar Refinery from its inception, including configuration, optimization, and technology selection. Formulated business planning for margin optimization via crude sourcing and product placements. Developed the SEZ Refinery Project to make Jamnagar the world's largest refinery. Developed the Petco gasification and Parasailing Train 4 sub-projects for, Jam for Jamnagar J3. He has a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Houston and a MS from Rice University, US, and a BTEC from IIT Bombay. There is so much to Dr. Partha Maitra's achievement and journey. I'm not sure I, it can all be summarized in the limited time in the session. Once again, a very warm welcome to you, sir. We are truly privileged to have you deliver this speech today. Those who know him say his enthusiasm is infectious. We are lucky to experience it up close today. Over to you, Dr. Partha P. Maitra. Uh Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that uh, very kind and gracious uh, introduction. Uh, more important, I am really happy to be back. Um, I had given a talk uh, on this same forum uh, uh, 
uh, in June, roughly six months ago. And uh, uh, that time I talked on the future of oil and gas. Uh, we are beginning to crystallize how to achieve a sustainable future. And uh, this journey uh, for various companies uh, with example from what we are doing uh, will be the talk uh, today. So, uh, so can, can I see the first slide, please? Okay, uh, uh, this is the second slide. Yeah, uh, so this is, uh, so the topic today is sustainability, the way ahead. Uh, and more important uh, for any now uh, uh, company anywhere in the world, uh, they are talking about sustainability. In fact, the latest, uh, uh, um, the latest, uh, uh, the analysts are saying that 60% of the people in hydrocarbon, non-hydrocarbon, any business, they are talking about sustainability. So without the prism of sustainability, we cannot move forward because what we have today, it, the business as usual is unsustainable and cannot continue. So with those, uh, uh, let me see the second slide. Okay, uh, this is a disclaimer saying that I am not representing Reliance uh, and I'm talking in my own personal capacity. The next slide, please. Uh, so the structure of my talk is why sustainability is very important. Then we will talk about energy transition of how to move towards sustainable energy or what is termed as clean energy. We, are, we will talk about renewable power and batteries, hydrogen and fuel cell. Uh, these are the four gigafactories which Reliance plans to build in order to achieve the sustainability objective. We will also talk about uh, once we have the tools, uh, how do we employ those tools in order to decarbonize the hydrocarbon processing? Uh, how do we use renewable power and hydrogen? Uh, what is COTC in order to, uh, which is crude oil to chemicals in order to decarbonize refining? Uh, also what we need to do to decarbonize petrochemicals, and finally, uh, uh, things on biofeed and uh, recyclable feeds. And we will top it all with the holy grail, which is uh, achieve net zero in our lifetime. So essentially, what I'm trying to emphasize to this great audience is that uh, sustainability shall drive the way forward or the way ahead in, in business and in all activities that we do. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, on the sustainability, uh, you can, uh, if required, you can increase it to a full uh, slideshow so that it covers the whole screen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is much better. Uh, so, uh, so a few words on sustainability. I think all of you know that sustainability is important. 
but let me reiterate why it is important. Now, the global warming is caused by greenhouse gases. And the major greenhouse gases are CO2 and methane, that is carbon dioxide and methane. And there is a direct correlation between fossil fuel and global warming because fossil fuels release greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases cause global warming and up to now, it has gone up to, uh, it says 1.1 degrees, but actually this year it will be 1.15 degrees. And the global warming, if it continues, the, the red line is 1.5 degrees. And beyond 1.5 degrees, we are talking of unprecedented and catastrophic climate change. And hence, whether we like it or not, fossil fuels, uh, we have to, uh, is the culprit, and we have to change our way of uh, energy, uh, power, and the way we live. So let's define what emissions mean, and they are characterized as scope one, two, and three. Scope one is direct emission from feed to product. Scope two is indirect emission uh, for utilizing the or creating the utilities to convert feed to product. And scope three is the related emissions uh, when it is used in product application or in the supply chain. That is both the feed supply chain and the product supply chain. Now, in a refinery, scope three is the predominant emission. And in a petrochemical, generally scope two is the predominant emissions. And we have to, net zero means we don't want any greenhouse gas emissions. That means no scope one, no scope two, and no scope three emissions. What is the state, uh, state of the emissions and global warming in the world? It's not a pretty picture. We are actually continuing to emit about 40 gigatons per year of greenhouse gases. That is over 40 billion tons per year. And instead of this coming down, forget coming down, it is actually still rising. Only the rate of the rise has decreased. Earlier, it used to rise by over 3%. Today, it is less, is about 1%. But it is completely uh, criminal that the greenhouse gases, which are an existential threat to us, is still rising in the world. Now, we need to bend the curve by 2030, and 2030 is not far away. And the world has promised uh, all the industrial economies, the OECD countries, they have promised zero emissions or net zero by 2050. China has promised in 2060, which is bad, and India has promised in 2070, which is equally bad. And if all the promises are kept, that means we are able to bend the curve in 2030, we are able to achieve net zero in 2050, India achieves net zero by 2070, in 2100, at the turn of the century, the global warming will be 2.8 degrees centigrade. That is the expert uh, opinion. And essentially, our planet is going to get cooked, which is pretty bad. And hence, we cannot have business as usual, and we have to change. And this change is termed 
as energy transition. Now, along the energy transition, there are several correlated transition. There is a power transition from fossil to renewable power. There is a mobility transition from ice or internal combustion engine to EV or electric vehicles. A refining transition, uh, which is what I know best from fuel to chemicals, or the uh, it is termed as COTC, or crude oil to chemicals. And fundamentally, uh, there is an economy transition from linear, that means use it and throw it, to circular in the future. So sustainability, you will agree with me, is mankind's greatest and an existential challenge. Why do I call it existential? Because if we continue to heat up the thing, we will be actually cooked alive and we, will, we may become extinct. And no one wants that for us. So, uh, so now you understand why sustainability is extremely, extremely important. I cannot overemphasize why sustainability for the future is the only way ahead. And with this, let's go to the next slide. So how do we do energy transition? That is, how do we go from sustain, uh, unsustainable fossil energy to sustainable energy? also termed as clean energy. There are four ways we can do it. Renewable power, hydrogen, CCUS, carbon capture, utilization and sequestration, and finally bioenergy. The most important is renewable uh, power, and it can come from solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, and tidal. Now, Please note that nuclear, though some people think it is a renewable power, it is not renewable power. So the real sustainable are solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, and tidal. And of these, the biggest are solar PV or solar phot photovoltaic and onshore wind. Now, because this renewable power, that is solar power or wind power, is fluctuating and not steady, uh, we need battery in order to stabilize renewable power. So renewable power is not only generation, but also uh, energy storage in order to supply 24-7 electricity. The really, really good news in sustainability journey is already it is competitive with fossil power. Uh, right now, solar power is roughly, roughly uh, in globally is five cents per kilowatt hour, whereas coal right now is uh, over five cents a kilowatt hour. So, um, Essentially, we have to electrify the global economy, and that is what may be called the 60% solution of energy transition. The other 20% solution is hydrogen. Now, existing hydrogen, gray and brown, are unsustainable. And on the right-hand side, you can see the, the four major sustainable hydrogen. One is green, which is from electrolysis of water. Blue, by doing CCUS to conventional hydrogen. And under development are gold hydrogen using biomass as feed. And turquoise hydrogen, which is methane pyrolysis. So hydrogen is around 20% solution. Next is carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration. And that's roughly another 15 to 20% solution. 
Now CC means carbon capture. U is to utilize CO2 and prevent it from going into the atmosphere, which can cause global warming. And the utilization can either be through trees or afforestation, algae. It can, we can convert CO2 into chemicals or what is termed as mineralization that is used as building blocks. And S is sequester in our fossil geology. Basically put the CO2 back into the oil and gas fields which have uh, lived its purpose. The bioenergy is basically from biomass. And if you use food as a biomass, it's called first generation. Second generation is non-food, which is agricultural residue and forestry waste. Uh, the third generation is to glow, grow energy crops, such as algae. And finally, the holy grail is fourth generation, essentially, essentially mimic the plants or the leaves of the plant in order to do uh, photosynthesis. So these are the four ways we can transition from fossil to clean energy. So next slide, please. Now, renewable power, which is the main solution, is already, the good news is competitive with fossil power. And in future, with renewable power, the energy source, which we last 100 years was considered as a fuel, will convert or transform into power. So electricity will be the main energy source and not fuel as we have been used to for, for our lifetime. So again, I will repeat, we have to electrify the global economy. So let's talk about what Reliance is doing. Uh, and we are planning a solar PV uh, gigafactory with two into 10, that means two trains of 10 gigawatt per year, which is essentially 20 gigawatts of year of solar PV module manufacturing that is also going to be co-located in Jamnagar. Now, why do we choose uh, 20? There is a reason for that. India has promised in the global forums in the COP 26 and COP 27, that we will have renewable power of 500 gigawatts. Just excuse me. Okay, I'm back. So 500 gigawatts, of which the solar power is supposed to be 300 gigawatts and Reliance as a part of the promise of India has said we will supply 100 gigawatts of solar photovoltaic capacity by 2030. So 100 solar will be supplied by Reliance, uh, another 200 by other Indian companies, 300 will be solar power and if you add wind, hydro, tidal, and geothermal, we will go up to 500. That is the game plan. Now, we ourselves, being the largest corporate, we have uh, requirements for power, and we think up to 2030, with all the expansions which are being planned, including the four gigafactories, we will require slightly less than 20 gigawatts as our internal uh, consumption in order to make Reliance net zero. So essentially out of 100, uh, Re Reliance will supply 100 gigawatts and will consume out of that around 20 gigawatts for our own captive requirements. 
Now, where are these solar photovoltaic modules used for? It will be used in energy parks, uh, essentially big football fields with shining solar modules. It will be used in rooftop solar, that is all places in, the, in India and the world will have solar panels on their roof. And finally, uh, India, which has a lot of lakes and rivers and canals and water bodies, we will have floating solar, which, ha which will have a double, uh, it will reduce the evaporation of water uh, because water also is a scarce commodity in India and plus generate uh, solar power. So the whole purpose of, gener of building this uh, gigafactory number one uh, to manufacture and supply solar PV modules is uh, in order to align with Atmanirbhar integrated manufacturing. So let's talk about this solar PV factory. Now, you know, uh, the solar PV, it starts from sand which is called the quartz sand or quartzite. And essentially, the integrated manufacturing means there are four stages. The first stage is polysilicon. The second stage is wafers, just like potato wafers, but shining sand wafers. Next is cell, uh, which is NP junction, which allows the, the light to be converted into electricity. And finally, all of this is housed in uh, with a glass on the top and the glass in the bottom and with aluminum frame uh, and a module in order to be deployed outdoors. Now, so the first step is polysilicon and it is known as a monocrystalline polysilicon and it is 99.49, or in other words, 69 percentage pure silicon. So it's a, it's a really complex process. Then you uh, chop it into wafers. It is, in fact, very, very similar to Pringle uh, chips. Uh, then the wafers have to be doped in order to have what is known as the negative junction and the positive junction or NP, and then it becomes a cell. Now, we have partners in order to do that. So our biggest partner is REC Solar, which is a Norwegian company. And they have a technology which is called HG, HJT cell, which is heterojunction cell technology. Right now, the the state of affairs in the world, uh, and when I say world, it is mainly China, because China dominates solar PV. Uh, they uh, manufacture about 70% of the solar PVs. They use about 30, 35% in China, and they export about 30, 35% out of China. So essentially, we cannot have a factory in India which cannot, uh, which cannot uh, compete with the Chinese solar PV. And with the uh, China right now makes what is called PERC uh, cells, which is passivated emis uh, emission rear cell technology. Uh, but HJT cell is a next generation technology. And next generation means it's roughly around one, one and a half percent higher efficiency. But in this business, even one percent efficiency is very important. Uh, so we have actually bought over this REC Solar. And REC Solar is uh, actually a technology powerhouse. I mean, it is a 1200, uh, it is around 25 year old company. They have only around 1200 employees, but they own uh, in the solar power roughly 500 patents. I mean, they are truly, truly 
an intellectual giant. And we are very fortunate to have them uh, supply the technology for, for this integrated manufacturing of solar PV modules. But again, we have to be cognizant of the threat from China, and that is not only in Ladakh and Arunachal Pradesh, but also the solar PV cells coming from China. And hence, we have another tie-up with Kalux. This is an American startup, and essentially, they have something called petroskite film, which if you put on these solar panels, it increases the efficiency by another roughly 1%. So 1% by using HJT technology, which China is now scrambling to, to change, and 1% from petroskite technology will keep us ahead of the competition from China. We also are a part owner of Sterling and Wilson, it is a Shapurji Palunji company, and they are very big in uh, EPC, that is engineering procurement of construction of solar PV modules, as well as to maintain them. So not only we will supply these modules, we will also help uh, in, in installing these modules in India. And finally, we have what is called the moonshot, that is, we have a tie-up with Nexwafe. It's a German company. And essentially now, if you look at that integrated manufacturing, the making of the wafers is the most energy intensive. In other words, it is the most emission intensive. And when we have to go to sustainability, we have to ensure that we reduce the emission even while we are manufacturing the solar PV module. And hence, Nexwafe has a technology which is still not, uh, not uh, commercial. Uh, it is at uh, pilot plan stage, uh, TRL5, uh, but essentially it is epitaxial vapor deposition. And what it does is it reduces the energy consumption of producing wafers. And we hope that when it become commercial, let's say in two, three years, we will again employ in our solar PV gigafactory number one, and again, keep ahead of the famous Chinese products. But once we have solar PV supply up to the cumulative of 100 within the next 100 gigawatts, within the next uh, eight years, uh, we think we can, uh, I mean, ideally, we should try to eliminate or minimize fossil power and transition from fossil to renewable power. So with that, let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, whenever we talk renewable power, we have to talk batteries because of fluctuation and intermittent supply. So batteries basically are energy bat uh, are used for energy storing. Now there are two types of batteries which are called mobile batteries, which are used to store the power or energy for EVs or yes. electric vehicles. And finally we have the stationary grid for grid power supply. Now, essentially, mobile batteries are dominate the battery space. It's roughly 90% of all batteries are mobile batteries that is used in EVs or electric vehicles. So with that, uh, we are planning a battery factory, and that is termed as gigafactory number two, and here, we haven't made up our mind. In other words, we are still evaluating options. And the options we are evaluating are three in number. There is Lithium Work. It's a German company. 
which makes the LFP batteries. Now, of course, the majority of LFP batteries are made in China, but uh, outside China, Lithium Work makes LFP batteries in Germany. And these are also the famous batteries used in Tesla cars. Why LFP is important? It's a mobile battery. Why it is important? Because today in the battery world, it is the lowest cost battery in the world. And that is LFP. So we are thinking that we will build a battery factory with LFP. We haven't made up our minds yet. The other is Faradion, and Faradion is uh, somewhat even more remarkable. It is a non-lithium battery. In other words, it is a sodium ion battery. It beats, uh, we believe, it will beat lithium ion in the future, not today. So let's give you an example or, or give you the numbers. So today for a kilowatt hour of energy storage, uh, lithium ion batteries cost between $130 and $140 per kWh. Sodium ion is about $180. So it is not competitive. What we believe in the future the lithium ion will may come down to about 100 to 110, maybe 110 to 120. But the sodium ion will go below $100 per kWa. And when that happens, sodium ion will become the, I mean, will be the battery of choice. May not be for, for mobile batteries because lithium is still the lighter material but for grid storage batteries or stationary batteries, it may become the battery of choice. Now, this is a startup which is being done by four people from Oxford University, including one PIO or, uh, or uh, uh, a person of Indian origin uh, who is uh, who we are. Uh, I mean, we are interacting or interfacing with for the Faradion battery. Faradion is not yet commercial. Uh, uh, it may become commercial in the next year or two, but, uh, and it may beat uh, uh, lithium ion in the next four or five years. And uh, as they say in the business, uh, we are keeping a close watch uh, and we have a tie-up with uh, Faradion uh, in order to build uh, sodium ion batteries in India. The third is even more uh, radical battery, and it is a liquid metal battery. And the great thing about this liquid metal battery called Amri, it's a MIT uh, <coughs> spin-off. Basically, it does not use lithium, it does not use cobalt, it does not use nickel, it does not use manganese, it does not use any expensive material. It uses calcium and antimony, which are inexpensive material. The only problem is it is a high temperature battery. In other words, it cannot be used for mobile batteries but it is pretty good for stationary grid batteries, especially in industrial locations. So uh, as of now, I cannot say what we are going to do in the battery uh, space or battery domain, but we are evaluating three, three uh, we are betting on three horses. One is LFP battery with uh, lithium work, uh, sodium ion batteries with paradion and non-lithium, non-sodium batteries, uh, which are called liquid metal batteries with Ambry. We will figure out maybe uh, in a year or two uh, which, uh, which uh, horse wins and where we are going to bet uh, for building this second gigafactory. So that is the battery story. Uh, next, let's come to the next 
Uh, slide, please. Okay. Uh, so the the other two uh, elements we are planning four gigafactories. I've already talked about solar PV or solar photovoltaic. Hydrogen. I am going to talk about hydrogen, but basically electrolyzer and fuel cell. So hydrogen can be either green or blue. And for green hydrogen, we require something which looks and behaves like a battery, but is known as an electrolyzer. The electrolyzer works on renewable power. And right now, the OPEX to CAPEX ratio, that is the cost of electrolyzer is around 30%. And the cost of renewable power in order to run the electrolyzer is about 70%. But the good news is both the cost of renewable power is coming down, that is OPEX. Also, the cost of electrolyzer is crashing, just like the batteries. And hence, there is a declining cost trend for green hydrogen. Now, there can be four types of electrolyzer. One is the alkaline uh, electrolyzer, which is the conventional, which is essentially around 100 years old, which is what the battery that you and I know of. The modern battery is called the uh, PEM or proton uh, 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 proton exchange uh, membrane. Exchange membrane. Exchange membrane uh, that is, and both are commercial right now. The other, there are two which are under development, which is SOE or solid oxide electrolyzer, which is somewhat similar to the liquid metal battery I talked about previously. And then there is something called AEM. So EM stands for exchange membrane and A instead of proton, it stands for uh, uh, anion uh, that is uh, so proton positive charge goes to the negative electrode and anion, which is OH, is negative charge, it goes to the positive electrode. And um, right now the cost of hydrogen is roughly around $5. And so let me put it into perspective. The, the unsustainable brown and uh, Gray hydrogen cost about a dollar and a half, uh, dollar point five, one point five dollar per kg of hydrogen. But if you have to do CCUS in order to make blue hydrogen, it cost uh, one, uh, around two and a half dollars, two point five, and versus that the green hydrogen cost around five, so it's roughly double the cost. But there is a, a, a a serious cost decline in the case of electrolyzer and green hydrogen. And we are hoping that by the end of this decade, essentially 2030, we will have what is called the one, one, one. That is dollar one for one kilogram of hydrogen in one decade. And if it happens, the entire energy seen in the world will change and India will become an energy superpower with hydrogen. So we are not there yet, but we are contemplating gigafactory number three for green hydrogen. And we have a tie up with a Danish company. So we have a lot of tie ups, by the way, with a Danish company, uh, Stiersdal, in order to make large electrolyzer. We haven't decided whether it is alkaline or PEM, but essentially large electrolyzer. And the claim to fame of Stiersdal electrolyzer is what is known as integrated solar power and hydrogen. Essentially, uh, the photons are converted to electrons and the electrons, instead of becoming an electric current, 
are converted directly to hydrogen. So essentially think of this as a big football field, uh, and especially this is uh, uh, important uh, on the day of the World uh, Cup final, a big football field of solar PV panels, and right in the middle, in a small truck-like space, there will be an electrolyzer which will convert all those electrons ge uh, generated by the solar PV panels into hydrogen. So that is gigafactory number three. We don't know when we will work on it, but uh, the plan is to do that sometime in the next few years. And the fourth is the fuel cell, which is hydrogen to power on demand. And essentially, we have a interest in doing this because we plan to have, uh, I mean, today, India has all over the uh, place, we have DG sets or diesel generator sets. Tomorrow, we think it will be hydrogen-based fuel cells, and we plan to eliminate DG sets in India. And again, for the gigafactory number four, the plan is to ha uh, have a tie-up with Stiesdal. Uh, and for that, we are very clear. We don't want to make uh, alkaline. Uh, we want to make PEM fuel cell. Uh, fuel cell, by the way, is electrolyzer in the reverse. Uh, so in electrolyzer, you convert power to hydrogen. And in good old fuel cell, you convert hydrogen into okay. next slide please okay so up till now we talked about the what we plan to do and now let's talk about how do we decarbonize our business so uh, the first business is to use renewable power and hydrogen to decarbonize. So let's go through what we plan to do. So in uh, a hydrocarbon processing facility like Jamnagar Refinery and Petrochemical Complex, the plan is to source renewable power. We want to minimize steam usage, basically steam will be a bad word in the future. We want steam-free refineries in the future. We want to electrify low-level heating. What we, today we do with uh, steam, we plan to do with electricity in the future. In order to do that, we plan to uh, evaluate opportunities to put heat pump and vapor recompression in in a hydrocarbon facility. That is, instead of just generating steam, uh, make it uh, into, uh, I mean, uh, transfer the energy to via a heat pump or a vapor recompression. And essentially, we want to decarbonize the hydrocarbon processing via electrification. So that is item one. Next is we plan to use hydrogen as a fuel because if it is clean hydrogen, it does not contribute to any CO2 emissions. So today we use in a refinery, refinery fuel gas or RFG as a fuel, but tomorrow we will substitute this RFG with principally hydrogen and RFG will become surplus. Now, we also plan to produce green hydrogen from surplus renewable power, and essentially that will be again to use it to abate uh, cement plants, paper factories, steel mills, and refineries, and petrochemicals. Uh, the other is the blue hydrogen. Remember, blue hydrogen still costs uh, cheaper than green hydrogen today. And of course, if we can get this uh, turquoise hydrogen, it will be a game changer in the future. So how do we get blue hydrogen? 
we have to i i mean in a refinery like jamnagar the plan is to use it for algae uh, growth uh, which can be then used as a biomass feed or mineralization basically what mineralization is a word that is basically the cement we cure the cement today uh, in, using water uh, and the cement uh, becomes solid concrete but we can also cure it in future with uh, with uh, co2 and thereby making again solid concrete so that is termed as mineralization and finally the s or the sequestration is to store it in what are called uh, uh, caverns uh, which have salt water in them and or in depleted oil and gas fields but for blue hydrogen to work we require a carbon pricing which is still not there in the world uh, there, it is beginning to develop it will develop in the next 2 3 years and for all of this to work we require roughly a carbon pricing of around 100 dollars per ton uh, and then only it will be a level playing field with fossil energy and clean energy so essentially the refineries and petrochemical plants of today and tomorrow will be decarbonized using renewable power and hydrogen uh, clean hydrogen uh, so next slide please so let's talk about cotc because refineries today produce uh, fuels and if there is a mobility transition from uh, internal combustion engine or fuel burning engine uh, to evs uh, there will be no place uh, there will be no demand for fuels so we believe that the gasoline demand will peak in 2030 people can have different opinion we also believe that the diesel demand will peak in 2040 again people can have different opinion but by 2050 uh, there won't be any diesel any gasoline or any fuel for transportation so what do we do with refinery so re we have to go for what is called refinery to chemical transition now making these products like lubes solvents and specialities they can continue in refinery but producing fuel is a no no and this is important in order to eliminate what is called scope three emissions of uh, in refinery now in order to achieve net zero in 2050 we believe that the refining capacity and this is not we this is uh, ei uh, uh, energy uh, uh, essentially uh, eia uh, the energy uh, agency of the world basically what they are saying is that the refining capacity has to come down from 100 to around 25 today around 10% is used for chemicals crude tomorrow it will be around 18 uh, or 18 million barrel but 18 out of 25 million barrels refining is around 72% so this is a graphic demonstration that uh, by 2050 there won't be any stand alone refineries left it will only be cotc or crude oil to chemicals and on the right hand side uh, it's a little complicated uh, sketch but essentially in the crude oil we divided into three segments the light ends on the top the mid range in the middle and the uh, heavies in the bottom the light ends can be going directly to a steam cracker in order to produce olefins and aromatics or chemical building blocks heavies uh, uh, cannot be either thermally cracked in a steam cracker or catalytically cracked and hence they have to be upgraded to mid range and in the mid range either via hydro cracker we make more light ends or via a high severity fcc which is what we plan 
we plan to make more olefins and aromatics. So in a nutshell, the sketch for COTC is, uh, is shown on the right hand side. But whether we like it or not, all refineries will have to transform or convert to COTC in order to decarbonize because fuels will disappear from the world. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, we said there will still be chemicals or petrochemicals and 72% of crude oil will convert into chemicals. And hence, we have to decarbonize chemicals. So first of all, the chemicals mainly will be sourced from COTC. So standalone petrochemical plants, just having a steam cracker, it will be, will be obsolete. The cracker of the future will be a different cracker from today. Because today we use around 17, 18% fuel, high emissions, no good. And hence we have to minimize this energy intensity, get it down from 18% to below 5%. And we have to maximize the electrification. So maximum electrification, high energy intensity uh, uh, is the way for the cracker of the future. So tomorrow's cracker will not be the same design as today's cracker. And today's steam cracker also has to change. Next, uh, polymers or chemicals that we make, uh, polymers and polyester, they have to uh, follow the fundamental principle of circularity. Linear usage of polymers is a complete no-no. And hence, we can either have chemical recycling or mechanical recycling. Today, unfortunately, majority of recycling is mechanical recycling. But tomorrow, we will do chemical recycling. And there are three types of chemical recycling. There will be pyrolysis, depolymerization, and solvent treating. The difference is very simple. In solvent treating, we recycle back to the polymer stage. In depolymerization, we recycle back to the monomer stage uh, in order to polymerize later on. And in the pyrolysis, we, uh, deep, uh, uh, we recycle back to what is termed as uh, a cracker feed or naphtha stage so that we can crack it again to make uh, the chemical building block. Tomorrow, the polymers of tomorrow are also going to be different. They're going to be advanced polymers. Uh, in other words, we will have to substitute metals instead of, uh, because metals, by the way, is much, much more uh, energy intensive uh, or with the mining and other things than making the polymers. In fact, today, a polymer uh, emits uh, less than, uh, I mean, one-fourth, uh, about 25% CO2 compared to steel. And if we can recycle all that polymer, it will be a game changer. And most of the things that today we use metals, tomorrow we will use polymers. We also have to do light weighting because uh, EVs, they have to have the uh, heavy energy storage and you have to make sure that all of these uh, stored energy, which is carted out in EVs, they have to be as light a weight, but durable as possible. Also the hydrogen economy will require new polymers because hydrogen, as you know, a steel is no good for hydrogen unless it is austenitic steel. Basically, uh, regular steel, carbon steel, causes what is termed as uh, hydrogen embrittlement. And hence, we will use a lot of FRP, or uh, uh, what is called fiber reinforced plastic. So that will be the plastic of the future. The hydrogen is very important. Hydrogen tomorrow will be a feed for chemicals when the cost of hydrogen comes down to 111, and it will also be a fuel 
for chemical synthesis. And finally, we have bio, which is biomass or plastic waste as feed. And if we retain the oxygen of biomass in polymers, they are termed as biopolymers because they, uh, they are sustainable because they can degrade in the ground and they not, do not last for thousands of years. Next slide, please. Okay, so bioenergy. So we have to uh, uh, we have to supplement the fossil uh, crude in the future with biomass, and we are looking at agri residue and forestry waste. For doing that, we require something called HDO or hydro deoxygenation. And so the plan is in Jamnagar, several of the hydro treaters are going to be converted to HDO in order to make what is called SAF, that is sustainable aviation fuel. Among the trans, tra, transportation fuel, which will still survive, people believe in 2050, is only aviation fuel. The drones will be electrified but for, uh, for us to go into the air, we are still hesitant to go in electric airplanes. The biomass gasification to syngas will generate gold hydrogen, and a lot of these surplus hydrogen will use will be converted to ammonia because ammonia will be the energy uh, trading uh, medium in the world, just like today LNG or oil is traded, tomorrow hydrogen will be traded in the form of ammonia. Now for the recyclable, the plan is for Jamnagar to source mix or end of life plastic waste, co-feed in the coker and the gasifier. In the coker, it will generate pyrolysis oil and basically coker naphtha which can be used in, in, uh, 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 in a cracker. Uh, and in gasifier, it will produce syn, uh, syngas, which can be converted to chemicals. So with this recyclable waste plastic, we plan to supplement the steam cracker feed and thereby promote the circular economy. So the next slide, please. Uh, this is my final slide. So today, uh, the, the refineries are complex, but if you look on the right-hand side, and it is denoted in red because it cannot continue, uh, essentially they are complex, but they have simple concept. So in the Jamnagar refinery, we bring in crude and LNG as a supplemental fuel. We produce fuels, we produce chemicals, and we produce, unfortunately, a lot of CO2. Uh, similarly, in gasification, which is also there in Jamnagar, we take pet coke, which is a residue of crude. We produce the captive power plant fuel, CPP fuel. We produce unsustainable brown hydrogen, and we produce a bunch of fired heaters fuel. It's all for fuel and power, but unfortunately, we produce a lot of CO2. And hence, it is denoted as red. That means we have to stop this business. And the green is on the right. So the refinery will continue to produce some amount of crude, but it will be supplemented by biomass and plastic waste. This is on the right-hand side. And instead of taking LNG as, a, as an energy source, we will have renewable power as the energy source and green hydrogen as the energy source. Essentially, captive power plant will disappear from most refineries. And we will produce basically durable polymers or polyester, basically chemicals, uh, that is COTC and SAF, which is sustainable aviation fuel. Now, remember, all this refinery fuel gas, they become surplus. So we will use a SMR, that is steam methane reforming or autothermal reforming, 
in order to produce syngas. And this syngas <coughs> will mix with the gasification syngas. Gasification will also be transformed. We will continue to have a little bit of pet coke but a supplement with a lot of biomass and plastic waste. And we will produce blue and gold hydrogen. The carbon will be utilized either for algae or mineralization. And a lot of syngas will be used for chemicals, prin principally methanol, acetic acid, and others. And hence, the plan is to be net zero in 2035. And that is the mission 2035 for the Jamnagar refinery petrochemicals and gasification complex. And we are uh, working towards it. It is 13 years away and it is a very exciting way ahead for sustainability. Next slide, please. And thank you very much for this patient hearing. Um, and I'm happy to answer some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Partha. We have listened to your speeches before. I must say you never disappoint. Your perspective is always refreshing. So we keep the floor open for question answers. Uh, participants, you may please unmute and ask your questions, please. Sir, this is uh, Sundar from uh, 96 Chemical Batch. Shall I have uh, ask some questions? Yeah, please, 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 please go on, Sundar. Sir, first of all, thank you very much for uh, this session, sir. I introduce myself. I'm a chemical engineer from Anamal University 96 Batch, and I'm presently into finance side, stock market, and whatever. And we do hold uh, reliance shares as well. Sir, my question is like, uh, uh, I understood India needs around 820 gigawatts of uh, power by 2030, uh, out of which around 500 gigawatts is needed from non-fossil. And uh, there's a competition from Adani as well. And uh, I see Adani has started already installing uh, solar power in three places, uh, one in Tamil Nadu, one in Punjab, and uh, in Uttar Pradesh. Their target is 25 gigawatts by 2025 and 45 gigawatts by 2030. And I understood Alliance uh, targets 20 gigawatts by 2025 and around uh, uh, 100 gigawatts by 2030. No, my, my quest first question is like uh, how much uh, reliance is producing today and uh, is this 2025 uh, target achievable sir okay um uh, that was a long question but basically there is a difference between what anyone in india is doing is uh, right now no one manufactures poly silicon in india no one manufactures wafer in India. The only thing manufactured in India is cell and the PV module. So whatever you are coating, they are getting the raw material from China and setting up solar power plant. Reliance right now makes zero, but essentially we will make it without Chinese raw material. One one last question. Is it okay? Shall I ask? Sure, go ahead. Go, sir, go on. In, sir, in case of uh, crude oil, Reliance as an international market, uh, you earn in terms of uh, dollars. Whereas in case of this power generation, uh, the prime target would be India because as of today, there is no international power grid. In case of crude, you refine, you send it through ships and all country buys it. Now, when you enter into the power sector, you are locked within India because there is no international grid existing, but there's a plan, I understood. In that case, your revenue from dollar terms will come to rupee terms. Now, how this will be feasible for your company in terms of return of investment or earning per share, keeping the shareholders intact? That's all, sir. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me ans uh, answer this question. Uh, shareholders are important. Return on investment is important, but sustainability is paramount. If you are not sustainable, there will be no uh, mankind left. There will be no reliance and no shareholders. So uh, essentially what we are saying is 
that in future we plan to make hydrogen and if that hydrogen is 111 in other words dollar 1 per kg of hydrogen in one decade that hydrogen as i told you can be traded and the plan is in future if we can achieve that the hydrogen will be converted to ammonia and we will be an exporter of ammonia today we import crude oil and then export a part of it half that as a product tomorrow we will not import anything uh, i mean and uh, whatever we export will be hydrogen uh, will be ammonia i mean hydrogen in the form of ammonia so uh, i mean continue to be a shareholder because i think uh, we are planning to make it uh, not only profitable but sustainable for the future ramesh thank you sir ramesh go on ramesh Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, this is Ramesh. I'm, I am the hard fan of Dr. Maitra. I always wanted to be him when I was in Reliance. Uh, emulate him in many ways. Uh, thanks for having him here. So my question is, uh, Dr. Maitra, you talked about uh, biomass and uh, you know plastic recycle as a additional fee to refinery. So what type of uh, feed you are uh, envisaging, and what are the challenges uh, you are thinking for this type of uh, additional feeds? um uh, actually it is uh, um, i mean uh, biomass the problem is to get biomass to the refinery is uh, basically the gathering and getting the feed is very uh, complicated and expensive so the feed supply chain is not profitable so the plan is that the biomass in the agricultural location will be torrefied basically made into pellets uh, uh, it's called torrefication and then the tor torrefied biomass basically from agricultural waste which is done by what is known as uh, as fast pyrolysis uh, essentially they will drive out the unwanted <laughs> moisture and all and the solids will then be transported to refineries around and will be used as a feed so that is the case of the biomass feed but remember this biomass continue will continue to be a supplemental feed in other words the biomass feed will be maybe 10% maybe 15% but no more than that similarly in the plastic waste we want to collect all the plastic waste and um, Uh, and we have uh, as you are aware we have two large cokers and uh, we plan to have around 10% of the feed in the cokers as plastic waste and if we can do that it will solve the plastic waste problem at least of india just an additional question doctor raise uh, so there is a plan by uh, cpcl chennai petroleum corporation to uh, put up uh, 9 million tons per annum refinery in nagapatnam so they are going to start it like you know so uh, the configuration initially looks like a very typical uh, uh, refinery of the uh, the past configuration so what is your suggestions uh, for cpcl as a uh, future actually, refinery actually uh, yeah, i mean uh, with the evs taking off um, uh, i mean evs have just started taking off in in this decade the 2020s and evs will dominate in 2030 so uh, whether you like it or not refining is a sunset industry and if you are going to build a refinery for fuels it is it is uh, it's a bad idea if you are going to build a refinery for cotc essentially 50 plus percent chemicals it it may be a good idea but today Uh, anything in refining is not a good idea i mean new refining okay so thank you gopi can i ask a question this is varda from chennai sir sir please go on sir See, please go on sir varda sir please go on hello uh, uh, dr partha 
as usual uh, as gopi said you never uh, disappoint the crowd so you are a great crowd puller thank you for coming in my my question is i i don't see any common utilization plan in your grand scheme of things so what's uh, your personal thinking on the carbon utilization part okay um we have we have three ideas so first is um, the plan is to grow some algae because uh, like trees algae uh, uh, consumes five times faster co2 and that algae can become a biomass material i mean recycle uh, for carbon recycling that's item 1 item 2 is i said uh, we have uh, we have a bunch of cement plants around the place and the plan is to use the co2 as as a uh, as an agent uh, for uh, making building blocks for for houses of tomorrow uh, these are these hollow 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 cement blocks which can go for housing uh, uh, that is item 2 but item 3 is even more remarkable uh, basically if the hydrogen becomes very inexpensive not yet but tomorrow if it becomes inexpensive the hydrogen plus co2 can form syngas and the syngas can be used to produce what is called e fuels uh, that is saf or e chemicals that is a bunch of chemicals so so that is the thing but for that the hydrogen cost has to come down we are monitoring that but be rest assured uh, whatever makes uh, economic techno economic sense we will do it ashraf can you unmute and ask your question please ashraf yeah Uh, good afternoon, sir. This is Bopi uh, Rao from Chennai Petroleum Corporation. Uh, it's quite uh, just to lecture, of course, in simple uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation. All it was quite nice. Uh, actually, my fundamental question is that uh, I have said that there there will be kind of uh, uh, demand for the kind of loop loop uh, products. They are going to be there. Continue. That may not uh, kind of uh, decline for. Uh, even decades to go but uh, in the process of making loops the source could be only kind of crude oil then we we do make the other fuel products how how that how that gets addressed i cannot i can't make the loops uh, by not making the other fuel products like diesel and sk or whatever Okay oh, uh, good uh, good, uh, good question but uh, completely uh, if you look at the demand the loop demand is less than 2% of all crude processed in other words uh, um, if you take only 2% of the crude to make loops you will make loops now the question is uh, fuel will make, be produced as a co-product remember in co2 tc the whole of these co-products will be will be either catalytically cracked or thermally cracked steam cracker in order to make petrochemicals so uh, produce loops but from 1% of the crude uh, that is from uh, but the remainder of whatever is a co product instead of pu putting it um, uh, uh, instead of putting it uh, in in fuel products uh, convert that into chemicals that is the whole basis of cotc ashraf you may ask your question ashraf yeah, yeah. talk about the thanks for condensing the entire net zero in couple of slides which gives a broad view of the situation reliance as a company and we as nation are there i'm coming from a skepticism point of view and you read about all this uh, lithium battery cells and the amount of energy and raw material used to convert or let's say take out lithium from lithium mining and also the challenges when you have this electric power cells or solar panel the recycling of it uh, 
has Reliance, I know Reliance is going to put big uh, solar plants. Is there any thinking on Reliance how even on, to establish the recycling of the solar panels? No, we, we will have to, uh, again, uh, remember uh, this uh, linear use is history. It is bad, bad for us, bad for mankind, bad for the planet. Now, we will have to go to the circular economy. So essentially, whether we like it or not, the EV batteries will be completely recycled. The solar panels will be completely recycled. So it will all be recycled. So um, uh, yes, today, um, I mean, when, when there is a growth phase, you don't have enough material to recycle. But people are saying that from 2030 onwards, the recycling will produce more materials than what is coming from mines. And by the way, just to put the matter in perspective, the total amount of mining, that is uh, uh, the amount of emissions produced, is less than, less than, I mean, is a fraction of a percentage of the amount of fuel that you burn in a car. So, uh, I mean, this uh, holier than thou attitude that lithium mining is bad, uh, please get over it. Yes, yeah, yeah, CP, CP, please go on, CP. CP Joshi. Uh, Dr. Maitra, a very good uh, session. In fact, uh, very valuable information. I just wanted to know more about how SAF will be generated uh, in a refinery through biomass. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit of a route? Uh, SAF can be uh, generated, uh, I mean, relatively simply. So if you have a, a biomass, um, um, as I said, uh, essentially the bio, it's a three, three step process. There is a pre-treating. Uh, finally, we have the, the main reaction, which is HDO, which I alluded to. And thereafter we have a post-treating, which is again hydro-treating in order to make it uh, uh, basically jet fuel compliant. So, I mean, in, in, uh, in short, uh, various with the hydro, hydro processing route, we can convert biomass into, into uh, SAF. So that is one way to do it. The other way is if we can gasify it and make it as syngas, the syngas can be, uh, there is a, a conventional process called fissiotropes. And this fissure trope synthesis can convert this syngas to a, basically a jet, uh, jet uh, boiling material, which will be SAF. So, and there are already some patented technologies which can convert syngas into, into SAF. There are patented technologies and catalysts available in the market to convert biomass into into SAF. So SAF is there. The only problem with SAF is it is much more expensive today. Uh, and that is the only problem. But if in future, um, uh, if the, for example, if the EU decides that any plane going to go to uh, European Union will require 50% of its fuel as SAF, you don't have a choice. Whether it's expensive or not, you have to comply with the regulations. And hence, you will make SAF. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mait. Yes, Mr. Ravindranath. Please yeah. go on, sir. Uh, hello, Dr. Maitra. <laughs> Ravindranath here. A long time. <laughs> yes. So, I, I just want, I think, excellent presentation as usual. I mean, uh, always. A pleasure listening to you with your uh, so much of knowledge and uh, and also thank you very much for the outlook of Reliance. You are the leaders in this kind of a segment in any case. And while you have explained quite well about Reliance and also what you intend doing decarbonization and the, through various means, just got two questions. One is on uh, is hydrogen. Uh, I'm talking about green hydrogen is used for. Uh, 
transportation sector, something like uh, heavy trucks, I think Germany or somewhere they are using. Uh, of course, I don't expect that to be liquid hydrogen because that's too low a temperature. But in some form like LOHC, they are talking about, right? Liquid organic hydrogen uh, carrier uh, using Tolvin and then uh, converting, I mean, absorbing the, the chemical and then uh, again regenerating in the point of use. Okay, I I will I will explain it from fundamentals. Now, if you have electric power, and if you can rotate a wheel with electric power, uh, uh, that is one way to move. But if you have to convert that electric power into hydrogen, there is roughly a 20% efficiency loss. And if that hydrogen then is used in a fuel cell in order to rotate a, rotate a, rotate a wheel, there is another 10 to 15 percent loss. So hydrogen as a as a propulsion medium roughly has a 35, I mean a 35 percent efficiency debit. And hence whatever as I again told, whatever you can electrify, electrify. Whatever you cannot electrify, please use hydrogen. And yes, there will be some places where hydrogen will be used in trains. There will be places where hydrogen will be used in, in, uh, in uh, heavy duty trucks. But essentially, in order to move hydrogen around, it is very expensive. And hence the hydrogen, if it has to be shipped across oceans, it will be shipped either as ammonia, methanol, or LOHC, that is liquid organic hydrogen carrier. But again, the remember, in order to convert hydrogen to LOHC and then again reconvert it back to hydrogen, there is an efficiency loss. In the future, in order to become the planet to become more sustainable, efficiency will become very important. So wherever there is an efficiency loss, it will be, uh, I mean, people will not adopt it. If there is an efficiency gain, people will rush to adopt it. <coughs> yeah, Ramesh, go on, Ramesh. Doctor, uh, in this uh, sustainability, so what is in it for the entrepreneurs? So how they can pitch in uh, not well, like uh, the, uh, by the way, uh, all, it is completely. In fact, up till now, what did entrepreneurs do? They produced a, an application and mainly in the information technology. Right now, all the apps that will come out in the next 30 years, forget information technology. It is all energy apps. The things are changing. So if you come out a way to make hydrogen, if you come out a way in order to use power, if you come out a way to do biomass, uh, I mean, why are we tying up with REC solar? Why are we tying up with uh, uh, MIT offshoot? Why are we tying up with Oxford offshoot? Because that is where, I mean, the thing is uh, uh, churning completely. It is an intellectual ferment. And if you come out, uh, if you have a, a bright idea, a brilliant idea, it is yours to to, uh, I mean, uh, you can not only uh, become very rich, but you can uh, you can uh, also uh, you can save the planet. I mean, right now, one of the richest man. What is his thing? It's electric vehicles, electric vehicle, uh, Tesla cars. He has become rich from that. So it's all completely entrepreneurial. In fact, um, Reliance would love to work with uh, Indian people who have bright ideas, bright application in the energy, sustainable energy sector. But you have to have an idea. No, actually, there's one point, doctor, in your presentation on all the acquisitions of Reliance, all in Western countries, right? Like you went to Oxford, you went to MIT, those type of technology. So uh, I know there are uh, the IITs are doing the research, but where 
there are certain activities that are happening but it is not uh, available around the around india so in so what are we what is your suggestions for the uh, industry institute uh, you know collaboration this type of thing no, no, we, we, we have to collaborate but remember look at nobel prizes how many indians have won nobel prizes and uh, reliance is a global company we want to get the best in the world you get some more uh, scientific nobel uh, technical nobel prizes in india we will be glad to support you but uh, there will be a, i mean this is this is the age of ideas and it is not in information technology uh, tomorrow's ideas will be in energy technology so how you do it how you get um, uh, people at the iits and other places annamalai university to develop but come out with ideas i mean game changing ideas that's what india needs yeah cp please go on cp joshi Yeah, Mr. Kandasamy, please go on. Unmute and please ask your question, please. <laughs> Hello, uh, this is Pariya Swami. This is Pariya Swami from um, um, IIT Chennai. Earlier, I have done a, IIT in uh, IIT uh, Chemical Engineering. I have done it. Subsequently, I worked in uh, Atomic Energy. Now, in your presentation, uh, the first uh, uh, slide itself, you ruled out the nuclear as a, an option for uh, carbon dioxide reduction. why is it so given the fact that uh, we have almost infinite uh, raw material availability in the form of uranium and the energy density is also very high so why we are ruling out completely nuclear option uh, actually i am not ruling it out uh, united nations is ruling it out and uranium is is a fixed uh, uh, it is like oil it's going to run out it has a lot of energy density but till you solve the problem of um of uh, fissile waste it is not sustainable uh, now fusion energy is not there yet but if you can say that the fusion energy works then it is uh, sustainable not today's nuclear uh, fission okay uh, both are contestable like uh, there is no technology uh, everything but... can be contestable but all i'm yeah. saying is these are the uh, in fact right now there are there are people who are trying to make nuclear as a sustainable energy but as of today it is not sustainable when it okay. happens um, i mean you win yeah and next uh, question is about the ccs now saudi aramco is doing uh, you know excellent work they are doing uh, they have taken a lot of initiative likewise reliance uh, uh, do they do you have any serious plans for uh, carbon capture and sequestration we have uh, we have uh, i mean we are evaluating it we are looking at the theory of carbon capture and sequestration uh, we are looking at geologic sites uh, where we can sequester but the only thing remember uh, i mean if you are a shareholder if we put something in the ground cost money to put it in the ground cost 100 Hundred hundred and fifty dollars per ton of CO two to sequester, and if we get zero in return, who will pay for it? Yes, sure, sure. Yeah, you're right. The third third question is, uh, as, I mean, what I understand is, uh, uh, like LNG transportation, uh, ammonia transportation will become uh, global, right? So for that, we we must have a lot of ammonia plants coming up, correct? Yes. so that is one uh, option which is uh, garrison and uh, no no course, but for ammonia plant to become global the cost of hydrogen has to go down correct the cost correct. of the hydrogen yes. is there is a primary requirement yes yes just one well, uh, ammonia ammonia production would be actually i mean it would be cost very really cost uh, sort of uh, not effective being uh, you know you have to put a separate asu the air separation plant produce nitrogen you know to add to the green hydrogen no, i don't think so that will, that, that nitrogen will come from uh, your uh, what do you say that uh, um you are you are cracking no the, the, the when no, you are cracking there is there is a 
you know, green hydrogen, so, uh, you need actually nitrogen. Green hydrogen doesn't have any hydrogen. The existing plants, you naturally you're getting uh, nitrogen in the air. You're burning the secondary former and then getting it to ammonia level. So I think what I understand yes, is something like a $300, uh, $350 per ton is going to go up to almost $800 per ton. So that's something like what Dr. Bartha has explained. The cost effectiveness of every initiative is the most critical part. Yeah, but, uh, only, only thing I want to caution you, Ravindranath, yeah. the cost of the ammonia is high, not because of nitrogen. The cost of uh, nitrogen in that ammonia is less than 10%. It is high because of hydrogen. And once even, the hydrogen cost... Sir, just a doubt. Down, just a doubt. You, no, even no, no, sorry, sorry. I, I meant that something else. That ASU plant will cost. ASU plant is not required for a normal uh, ammonia yes. plant, like blue hydrogen. Uh, it, uh, uh, again, uh, please remember, it doesn't matter what plants you require or what plants you don't require. But unless, uh, and, uh, I mean, between an electrolyzer and producing high, I mean, right mm -hmm. now people are not looking at green hydrogen to ammonia. They are looking at blue hydrogen to ammonia. Right. So essentially they are looking at an ATR, uh, an autothermal reforming, which does not require- That is fine, sir. No, that is fine. That is understood. But what is, I must raise the question is, in green hydrogen, the nitrogen cost out to be. Yeah, but um, uh, you have to remember there is some great thing going on the, uh, in the ammonia business. So let me explain. Uh, ammonia is still produced by a 150-year-old process called the Haber-Bosch process. Right. Right. You take hydrogen and you take, um, I mean, basically three hydrogen molecules and one nitrogen molecule and we make ammonia. It is just like a steam cracker for ethylene. It is extremely energy intensive. Anything which requires energy, a high energy intensity, uh, it, uh, tends to emit a lot. So right now the world, and again, this is for everyone who is listening to this, people are going to go towards electrochemics chemistry uh, instead of that brute force uh, synthesis of nitrogen plus hydrogen to form ammonia. If you can get electrochemical synthesis of ammonia, uh, I mean, it will change the whole business of ammonia. Anybody is working on that, sir, right now? Uh, every every, uh, every university is working on it. Mm -hmm. All right, absolutely. Yeah, CP, CP, please go on, CP. Sadakan Joshi, please go on. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, please, please go on. Go on. Yeah, uh, uh, one question from my side. Since Reliance is going to put up uh, solar PV gigafactory, you will need polysilicon. So is there any plan to put up polysilicon also? Because polysilicon is majorly imported from Korea and China. I, I, what were you listening? I just said we are going to have uh, uh, integrated <laughs> manufacturing. I mean, were you listening to what I was saying? What yeah. sand will produce polysilicon, will produce wafers, will produce yeah. cells and produce solar PV modules. Okay, thank you. Anybody else has a question? Just one last uh, question, doctor. Yeah, one last question, yeah. Yeah, uh, doctor, just one uh, point that strikes me, like you said uh, about Reliance, excellent. I mean, the way you are all planning but what about the rest of the country, the way the government is going ahead and then committing uh, net zero and then 1 billion tons reduction by uh, 2030 and so on. Uh, the kind of facilities required for electrolyzer manufacture, batteries, and also polysilicon for that matter, even PV, the uh, solar uh, panels. So how, do I, how are you going to, what, do you, what is your sort of uh, uh, view on this part? So many facilities would be required. Alliance is going for Giga Factory is fantastic. That's good. That's really going to be a savior for at least part of the, uh, the mitigating the CO2. I, I think um, we require more uh, 
uh, Reliance type initiatives in India, and there are people working on it. So I think it is it is happening. So. Yeah, what, what the scale, happened? scale, <laughs> scale at which it is happening, of course, would be mind-boggling in terms of funding. I mean, also financing for others. I've talked about it's going to be very difficult. To... Well, right now for yeah. solar PV, um, uh, uh, I mean, the big problem with solar PV is right now everything, uh, the starting raw material is coming from China. So in uh, India and the government of India is very... Uh, uh, very uh, uh, aware of this problem of being dependent on China, so they are uh, they are uh, giving what are known as PLI, production link incentive, uh, in order to set up. Uh, uh, I mean, substitute these uh, Chinese imports of batteries, Chinese imports of solar PV, uh, uh, and to have it made in India. A uh, lot of other players are also working on it because right now the philosophy in the world is China plus one. You cannot be completely dependent on China and plus one can be India. Similarly, Europe is now talking about Europe plus one. That means uh, when the demand comes down in Europe, the, the companies cannot grow and prosper in Europe. So they have to have another market for which... Uh, and that is EU plus one, and that one can be India. So the two major fundamentals going on in the world right now is China plus one and EU plus one. EU plus one is for demand or, and China plus one is for supply. Yeah, Ramesh. Yeah, Dr. Just one additional question on this coker technology. You talked about this plastic recycling into delayed coker. So how the technology is matured? Like, you know, for example, we already have many cokers in around the cities like in Chennai and Vaisag and Mumbai. Uh, so is it uh, that the refineries it can is, adopt at is, faster pace? It is, still, it is still under development, but uh, right now, uh, as you are aware, uh, the coker that we have is a Foster Wheeler coker. The Foster Wheeler, there is a name change. It is now called Wood, W-O-O-D. Yeah. So the Wood is uh, has developed a technology uh, in order to use it as a co-feed in coker. So there are, uh, I mean, it has to be solved, but it is a, it is a solvable problem. Anandraj, please ask your question, Anandraj. Uh, good morning, sir. This is Anandraj. Uh, as you said, uh, uh, henceforth, uh, in future, the future is uh, every refinery has to shift to crude to chemicals and uh, with, along with the steam crackers. And, uh, we cannot able to stop with the steam crackers. We have to build the downstream units like polymer units also, which needs a massive capital. Whether the Indian refineries are... Uh, Invest that much, uh, prepared for that. Uh, invest that much uh, high capex. Uh, it's a good question, but it's very simple. Uh, uh, if uh, if you do not invest, you will have to shut down. It's as simple as that. So uh, mm -hmm. basically, the future of refineries, which I talked about last time, essentially you have to convert it to to bio refineries. Item one, or you have to become uh, COTC. And if you don't do either of the two, uh, you shut down. And refineries, uh, not in India, but because in India, the demand is still growing, but in the developed world, the demand is coming down and refineries after refineries are shutting down. Okay, sir. My second question is, you told that uh, Reliance is targeting by 2035, uh, you will be converting everything to methanol and acetic acid. You will be manufacturing more methanol and acetic acid. Uh, in India, there is such a huge demand is there for methanol and acetic acid. I'm, I'm not saying everything will be converted. We will produce polymers. We will produce 
polyester, we will produce methanol, we will produce acetic acid, and we will produce a little bit of SAF. So, uh, and uh, our refinery, whatever, it's the largest in the world, will also be scaled down. Thank you, sir. So, so there's, uh, there's one question in the chat box from one of the budding engineers. It's a great session, sir. I have one question. I do agree Reliance has to get a good innovative technology. Reliance spends money for licensing, royalty, and etc. To avoid it, why can't Reliance set up its own research lab or collaborate with institutes to fund projects in indigenous to, de uh, to develop a new technology instead of buying a technology? Which he, will be uh, a capital he, spending, but in the long he, run, it will reduce our licensing, royalties, and profit margins, etc. Uh, you are 100% right. We have a big R&D thing, but uh, there is only so much we can develop in-house. We have uh, arrangements with a bunch of, uh, 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 I mean, uh, prominent universities and uh, institutes. We are doing all of that, but at the end of the day, you have to get results. So we are, we have a big R&D. In fact, for COTC, the, the key technology will be, will be, it's a homegrown, in other words, uh, uh, Reliance developed technology. But uh, but um, but uh, for electrolyzer, we don't have uh, people to do it. For uh, solar PV, we don't have people to do it. You you show me the people who can do it. I'll be happy to um, uh, to uh, look at it. But it has to be world class technology because remember you are fighting the chinese and the chinese are undercutting you 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 give me a technology or a way to technology tomorrow i we will be happy to entertain that that's the best model, Doctor, because I think your R&D can be used. For no, no, but R&D at the end of the day, they have to deliver. Yep. And also they would integrate what you're getting from there. There are lots of connectivity between that and what in your own refinery. So they're really helpful to have an R&D unit. That's a good model you're using. And time bound, I mean, you have to achieve all these in a shorter time. R&D is a little long drawn if you're sort of reinventing the wheel and doing everything yourself. No, no, it is uh, actually, uh, anyway, now the World Cup football is going on. We all play football, but <laughs> we have never qualified for the World Cup. <laughs> we are um, uh, roughly 100 in, in a country of 160 in, in the world uh, rank. I mean, what, uh, uh, you know, uh, show me some footballers who, who can take us to the World Cup. They're the old generation, I think they did play once. I mean, that's uh... So at least qualified, but not anymore. Yeah. No, no. But there are 32 uh, nations playing. We are not even in the top 32. Absolutely. I mean, uh, we we uh, root for France or Argentina. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> Small countries. We come to the concluding part. So, uh, can I uh, can I request Mr. N S Murthy to say a few words, please? N S M, sir. Uh, yeah, I have been a very patient listener of Dr. Maitra. It's really a, a heartening to have, uh, hear him after a long time. And I wish he keeps on uh, probing our team more and more with uh, kind of a challenges what he has shown about. Uh, only one word, I was a little bit uh, disappointed, I'll put it that way. Anyhow, it's uh, nothing harm in looking at it. He said that uh, industries, or particularly the oil industry, is in the sunset industry kind of. Uh, somehow, uh, when we joined oil industry way back in 1974, people said oil industry will wind up in about 20 years. And that kept on going every 20 years, it kept on adding. And I'm 100% sure that uh, with all the oil coming up, and uh, industry, oil industry particularly, will remain for another 100, 100 plus years, or maybe more also, I don't know, God willing. And suddenly the sustainability is very critical, there is no doubt about it. In fact, uh, learning from PPM, I'm also excited to insight some of our uh, academic to do certain research in whatever way we can think about. One point I thought I'd be share with the people is this, that uh, world has been trying uh, very hard on the biomass, how to get it aboard. I was told that uh, biomass particularly has got uh, what we call lignin, almost about 15 to 20% or even more in some kind of a case is aboard. If lignin has got plenty of aromatics with all uh, what, you know, oxygen attached here and there, etc., it's a very good natural polymer. 
If someone can make a breakthrough, I think this crude oil, crude chemicals can go for a toss. I mean, that's what I am of the dream I put it about. I don't know when it's going to happen, God knows. But certainly, so today they're not having any good separation technique for the uh, lignin out of the uh, cellulose material which is there. If this can be done in a very smart manner, and I'm sure this uh, what, you know, Nobel Prize will be there and one more Dhruva can be paid about. And uh, thanks, thanks to Dr. Maitra for his wonderful uh, uh, presentation as well as uh, thought process, whatever he has given. And I'm sure some of the things will certainly become a dream for uh, our country and we can be proud to be reliances at this part of India, rather than with uh, what you were saying, you know, like footballer. We don't uh, we watch football, but we don't uh, prepare the people. We have to challenge young minds to think through about. Thanks once again, Dr. Patrick. Thanks, Gopi, for organizing this wonderful event. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, sir. Thanks, sir. thanks for joining us, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Partha. Thanks for joining uh, us. Excellent time uh, we had. We had a lot of takeaways from your uh, lecture today, sir. Yeah, uh, only thing I want to point out is uh, earlier uh, when they say that the reserves of oil was only 20 years or 30 years, that is true. Even today, the reserves of oil are 30 years and more oil will be discovered. But the problem which no one talks about is along with that oil, you are put uh, oil and gas and coal you are putting a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that CO2 is killing all of us slowly. And it cannot continue, period. So whether the oil remains for 100 years, uh, in fact, the oil and coal will remain for 100 years. But we cannot, uh, we are like... Uh, 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 um, like uh, tobacco factories <laughs> um, 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 putting... Uh, I mean, selling a product which causes cancer. Uh, similarly, with the oil, you produce CO2 and you heat up the planet. It is like a frog in the in a uh, in a pan of uh, boiling water. Uh, he could jump out any time, but as the water is slowly increased, he continues to be there and ultimately dies. Let's like let's not become like that frog in the frying pan. No, you're right, Doc. Doc. I mean, what I'm trying to say is that... Uh, yeah, so... uh, Murthy, uh, it doesn't <laughs> matter. Oil will remain, coal will remain, <laughs> gas will remain. But whether no, no. you use it or not is a different... No, I agree with you. I agree with you. Certainly, I mean, the innovation has to come and there's some breakthrough has to take place, particularly... Yeah, with... and, and, and to talk about lignin, let's make life again simple. If you convert it from oil, it costs one. If you convert it from food, it, uh, which is sugar, molasses, sugar cane, palm oil, it's 1.5. If you convert it from uh, what is called uh, agricultural residue, it is two to two and a half. And if you do your famous lignin thing, right now it is four and a half, five times. And if tomorrow there is no use for oil, what will we do with lignin? Oh, lignin. Uh, in fact, the lignin has been cooked for the last millions of years in order to get you fossil crude and gas. That's okay. That's a, that's a natural conversion. But uh, what here we are trying to say is that uh, from lignin no, to petrochemicals. It, uh, lignin anything, to petrochemicals. We'll have to think in that. Anything, anything which has been cooked for a million years, you cannot beat that. You cannot beat nature. And hence, it will always be more expensive. So don't go on that path. Hello, let's see. I mean, how that uh, world changes too. I'm with you. <clears throat> and remember, when the oil demand comes down, the uh, the oil prices are not going to be hundred dollars. The oil price will go down to less than twenty five. No, see, like uh, COVID has taught us many things in terms of how we can manage the world without oil for at least uh, work from home kind of a concept. So maybe some of those also have to come through. Yeah, because you have to. You start using better when you know if something is going to die out so soon. That's what one has to take a call and see it about. Gopi, I have one question. Can I just, even though I think it's almost come to end up closing. Uh, uh, please, 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 please go on, go on. Sir, uh, as, a, as you rightly pointed out, of course, the we need to just travel towards the kind of petrochemicals and then 
completely doing away with the kind of uh, conventional fields. But uh, right now, the situation, as somebody has also put it, in India, almost all refineries, have they been on the kind of expansion spree. Almost close to around some 60 million tons per annum expansion works have been going on with the conventional units. Is it that the government so silent on these things? I am not. Uh, I am not getting the point, sir. Is it that or is it that that we continue to have a kind of a domestic demand continue to be there? That's why I think government must have been encouraging. I am. I am um, uh, <laughs> lost in that game. Okay, the oil you know, demand. Exactly is, is the oil demand is coming down in the world. Unfortunately, the oil demand is going up in India. And hence, people are wanting more refinery. It is better to refine oil within the country rather than to import refined products. But within 10 years, the whole thing will change. Once all the cars become EVs, where is the question of... Uh, of... So today, people are still having a myopic view. That is, whatever is happening today, it will proceed in the future. But even today, you have to know in India, in India, over 15% of the two-wheelers last, I mean, this year has become EVs or electric. Now, things are changing. And if you don't anticipate the change, you will become obsolete. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. So once again, thank you very much for your time, sir.